Um, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to issues of social justice, um, you know, we've, we've talked about it quite a lot uh, in, in this entire initiative that, you know, the, the concern of social justice is not something that can be separated from Christianity. You know, Christianity is by its very nature, it's a movement of society. It's a movement for change in our society. It recognizes the roots of things that are evil in our society and, and endeavors to change them. But we've, we have obviously often seen that um, a lot of problems in our society that we frame them in, in, in our, a lot of our modern Christian discourse, we see these big social ills as something of the past, oftentimes. You, you often see this a lot with, um, with a lot of modern preachers, not to call out anybody. But I think it's, again, because of our own unique privileges as you know, Christians who live in the West, um, where we're separated from a long distance, in, in, in the case of most of us, from war and from poverty um, and from, you know, the situations of, of sexism, racism, casteism, colorism that you know, used to plague us in our country of origin um, and in various countries around the world. But I think, you know, um, if you pay attention at all to the news, you can see quite a bit. Um, you know, especially our co-religionists in Syria and Iraq, the fe our fellow Syrian Christians uh, face quite a lot of, of suffering, you know, for the same beliefs that we can enjoy very happily, very freely uh, in this country. And I think um, discussing, you know, tr trying to understand why not only Christianity is persecuted in the Middle East, why it has been persecuted in India and and necessarily what led us not only here to Canada, but, but has led our community for the past 2000 years of its existence. Um, it necessitates us, you know, and it prevails upon us to have this discussion of the history of the church. And so without further ado, without further uh, introduction, uh, I present to you our fourth seminar of our series, uh, the anti-colonial history of the Martha Masurian Church of Malabar. You know, very formal term that we don't often use, but we will get into that in a second. So uh, just to see what the order of business is today, uh, we're going to be touching upon uh, these topics that you can see right here, um, you know, touching upon the word of God and also delving right back, back into our church history lessons. And I'm sure uh, quite a few of us remember them from Sunday school. Uh, I promise that it won't be quite as dry. <laughs> I think the pamphlets are often uh, a little bit dry, but hopefully um, this seminar will be able to make church history a little bit more alive and more relevant to you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's unpack today together the long history that the Marthoma and the wider St. Thomas community has of, um, of, of resistance to, um, to foreign occupation and to colonization, which of course is very relevant in the case uh, of, um, you know, the various political and, and legal processes that are engaged upon black and indigenous peoples in our society. Um, you know, they're all inherently connected to colonial domination. And it's important for us to understand our relationship with colonization to, you know, to really be able to effectively engage with, with Black and Indigenous communities and to, and to uh, engage with the gospel in the most meaningful way possible. So um, without any further ado on that regard, um, let's, um, would someone be willing to volunteer to lead us in a word of prayer? Yeah, I, I can pray. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Heavenly Father Jesus, we thank you for this uh, evening you've given us to come come together in your name, Lord. Lord, we thank you for every single person on this call. We thank you for the ones that couldn't make this call as well, Lord. We especially thank you for Sheldon for leading this seminar. Lord, we, we ask that you be with us for the next hour or so, Lord, as we delve into your word and into some of the teachings that uh, Sheldon has prepared for us today, Lord. We we ask that you open our eyes, Lord, not just to look uh, at the future, the present, but also our past, Lord, to understand where we're coming from, Lord, uh, so we can change the future and we can change uh, the future for better, Lord, Lord. We, we ask that you be with all our families, be with all of us during the next, uh, uh, in the coming weeks as well. into this seminar with let's, um, let's ground ourselves in the word shall we um, so if um, if someone would be willing to turn to uh, is anyone willing to uh, read the first bible verse uh, Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 to 36 
I can. Perfect. Matthew 10, 34 to 36. Uh, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so let's unpack that quote first and foremost. Now, this is something that I think a lot of Christians will hear that particular verse and will wonder, well, why exactly, you know, Jesus, the same one who says um, later on in the gospel, right, as he's about to be arrested, he, he, you know, he rebukes the disciples who attack those who, who persecute him and says, all those who die, who, all those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Why is it that Jesus brings up this, this metaphor, this notion of not peace, but a sword? Well, again, if you look at the core, the, the, the original roots of the verse, you look at the original Syriac translations, the, um, the original Aramaic language translation of the Bible, um, the word sword is actually used in a rather metaphorical terminology. Um, you see the word sword also refers to the term conflict. This whole notion that Jesus has come to bring peace on earth. Well, peace on earth, what does peace mean? Peace does not allow the presence of injustice. It does not allow the presence of unrighteousness. No, necessarily peace has to include justice for all human beings. When Jesus comes, he, he does come to bring peace in the eventual final sense. You know, he comes to prepare the way for the judgment day. He comes to provide us the final, um, the solutions, those particular words of, of wisdom that will guide us through until the end times. But what Jesus does not pretend to do is that he will simply heal all conflicts as is. There is right, there is wrong that must be um, encouraged or enjoined, you know, within our society. And Jesus recognizes that there is massive social unrest. There is incredible persecution that exists at this time. And not only at his time, but that, you know, he, 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 um, he previews the persecution that not only the, the righteous community, the church will face in the future, but peoples of all nations from all over the world. So when we look at the concept of peace, let us understand this, that peace, the notion of equality, these, no, these higher notions that we strive for involve conflict along the way. It involves righteousness and it involves, most importantly, perseverance and determination to get there. So that's somewhere to walk into this modern lesson. When we understand the notion of, of the resistance that exists within the gospel, this, this divine injunction to resist evil and to go forward with a, with a view towards um, not only, not merely condemning, but actively reparating and, and addressing the roots of evil in our society. So um, going on with that as a theme in mind, um, can we have someone please turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9? Um, resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, so what does it mean by the family of believers? Obviously we understand it to be the church. We understand it to be all righteous peoples who are gathered in the name of Christ Jesus on every single land in the world, in every single nation. But what does it also mean for the peoples who are subjected to colonization, who are subjected to other forms of persecution, um, various genocides throughout the world? People have looked to verses such as 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, as an inspiration, as a reminder that it is our duty in righteousness to, when we are confronted with evil, to, to pose resistance. Because all those who are righteous are faced with persecution by the forces of evil. You know, this is something that it, it essentially when we when we are presented with a, you know, a little bit more modern of a of an issue like colonization, um, which, of course, existed, you know, 1500 years after the time of the Gospels and the time of the early church. We also must understand the context of, you know, the, these these men who were divinely inspired, you know, the early apostles um, went forward with with the specific intention of writing down instructions for the Christian community to, to disavow and to combat evil with the appropriate moral tools. Um, 
Now, uh, can we please have someone turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12? Quite a good, so good. Uh, quite a good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, where unto thou art also called, and has in professed a good profession before many witnesses. Exactly. So, um. You know, without me talking too much, what do what does anyone want to volunteer what they take away from that um, particular verse? So it says that we have to fight for the right. Right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, and there is um Um, yes, no, exactly. Um, it, it, the, the entire purpose is to engage in, in the fight. There is, a, there is a notion of a fight. And, you know, and of course, in this, in this circumstance, um, Paul, again, he, he takes this, or uh, not Paul, sorry. Uh, Peter takes this opportunity to, um, uh, to engage in, a, um, in, a, in an injunction towards all Christian people that the tribulations that are to come are to be mimicked in the end of days that when things are you know um when things are falling apart all throughout the world conflict will persist throughout the earth but specifically when you when you, if you look at, at just the context that is provided in first peter there you see the devil roams around like a lion you know which is very interesting imagery throughout throughout the bible jesus is always portrayed as the lion you know, Jesus is always portrayed as the, as the king of the jungle. You know, he's, the, he's the noble creature who leads us all out. And of course, this is, this is what we follow. But we also, you recognize that the devil has incredible strength as well. You know, the devil has incredible strength. Now, what exactly does that mean when we talk about something like colonization? How exactly does that connect? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, you, you might consider me pulling at, uh, at very loose straws there to point out that the symbols of many colonial powers are in fact lions. You know, there are a, a vast number of global colonial powers, be it uh, England, various Scandinavian countries, um, who all use the lion as their, as, their, as their symbol. Now, I'm not necessarily saying these particular countries, you know, embody the devil, no. But what they bring, what they brought to India in the past is a devilish process. The sublimation of an entire nation of people, um, entire nations, entire continents of people to um, the hegemony, to the, to the uniform control of a single group of people, a single way of life. And even worse, especially for our position as Christians, a single way of experiencing the Christian faith. So when we understand that these sort of, these sort of massive huge presences that come to land on colonized shores present massive obstacles for local peoples to, to withstand. And yet, what does it still enjoin us to do? You know, we still are, we still are instructed to, you know, we, even though you suffer for a while, the God of all grace will call you and will, will himself perfect you and give you firmness and strength and a sure foundation. And what exactly does that mean for us as believers? You know, what exactly does that mean for us as believers? In the early days of the church, when the, when the nascent church was taking shape in India, of course, we faced persecution by um, various imperial rulers, non-Christian indigenous rulers that persecuted us as an indigenous Christian community. But what, what do we understand here? That there are people who, who, as we can see here, the devil takes on the form of the lion. The lion who is known as the righteous animal, the righteous, the, the king of the natural order, the very animal that Jesus is himself made out to be as dictated in the prophecies of the Old Testament, the lion of Judah. You know, the, the power that Jesus has is sometimes mimicked by the forces of devilism. You know, this, these forces of, of devilish power, these forces of hatred, these forces of sublimation and subjugation of colonized peoples. And this is, of course, the, you know, just, just for, for us to understand the power that our ancestors had to, 
um, to agitate against, to fight against. It is power that, you know, summoned every single ounce of their courage to go forward and fight. But what exactly are some of these tools? You know, what exactly are some of the tools that the church needs to uh, embody in order to fight these massive systemic problems, these systemic, um, uh, these cycles of, um, of exploitation and disenfranchisement of poor communities? That answer is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 to 17. If someone could please give us a read. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye many able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your limbs girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparations of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Thank you very much. So what exactly is Paul instructing us here? That, you know, this, this kind of connects back to the indication that Jesus provides us. You know, this again lends some more credence to the notion that in Matthew, tw in, in Matthew 10, Jesus is talking about a metaphorical conflict. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a war. You know, Christians do not need to resort to violence. In fact, we are specifically told not to throughout several times throughout the gospel. But it, it compels us to use spiritual weapons to stand firm in the truth, to stand firm in protecting the marginalized, to stand firm in protecting our identity, you know, to protect our faith, to protect our particular, um, our culture and the cultures of the marginalized peoples that surround us. It, it essentially calls us to don the armor of Christianity, the armor of the tools provided us by the gospel to strike out and defend those communities who are being subjugated by um, the, the forces of colonization, genocide, enslavement, and various other things that the colonial powers um, brought and in some cases um, took from the native communities and reinforced into our culture. Um, and something that we, uh, you know, it's something that we experienced all throughout the colonial period up until the modern day. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, just understanding this notion that there, there is a call to resist unfair powers. You know, Jesus, you know, he resisted the, um, the corrupted monarchy, the corrupted temples, uh, temple authorities, and the corrupted Roman Empire. You know, Jesus was a, a radical in many ways uh, for the time. You know, he addressed a lot of these conflicts from the point of view of returning, um, you know, spiritual sovereignty back to the people. I mean, Jesus says it himself, return what is Caesar's to Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. You know, people had been so um, obfuscated by imposed political authority. You know, they'd been led astray by the Roman Empire. They'd been led astray by their local monarchy. They'd been led astray by temple authorities who were allowing money changing to exist in the house of God, commercial activity in the house of spirituality. But Jesus, again, he reminds us that there is something higher. Riches do not depend on these, these earthly riches right here. You hand back all of these symbols of corruption. You eschew, you know, you reject all of these things that the foreign oppressor may put upon you. You treat them with love, but you reject them and you speak truth, you speak power. And that is the essence of the gospel. I mean, that is the, the, the positive injunction that is given upon us to go out into the world and enact, to enact change, to enact truth, to enact peace in the sense of, you know, the absence of violence, of course. As we discussed earlier, there is quite a, a standard of conflict here. But um, when we talk about conflict and, and understanding the notion of divine conflict, the notion of a, a spiritual conflict that exists within our societies, I think this, this context here that's been provided by the world will help us to understand um, the tenacity of the early St. Thomas Christian community 
in defending our unique percep perceptions of the faith and understanding our place within not only the Christian world, but in the global society as well against the sins that white supremacy, um, colonization, imperialism presented to the Indian society. So let's get a little bit more into the actual historical fact as well. So let's break down the name of the church. Everyone, you know, we always, of course, commonly refer to the Marthama Church as just the Marthama Church, but the Marthama Syrian Church of Malabar is the full formal official name of the church. So what does that represent? You know, Marthoma, of course, as we all know, it's the Aramaic term that describes St. Thomas, of course, being the church that St. Thomas implanted in India, in Malabar, you know, the second component of the name. But Syrian, where does the term Syrian come from? Does it come from the modern day state of Syria? You know, do we, do we take our orders from the president of Syria today? No. No, what the term Syrian reminds us is that there is a very different cultural context to our church from the churches of the rest of the world. We are, our church is rooted in Middle Eastern traditions. Our church is rooted in the cultural context that Jesus lived in at his time. Because let, rem let me remind everyone, Jesus did not speak Greek, did not speak English, did not speak Latin. He spoke Aramaic. He spoke the common tongue that was present throughout all of the Middle East and was spoken commonly between um, Jewish communities, pagan communities, you know, the nascent Christian community, what eventually would become the Muslim community. Um, various communities all use this common tongue as, as, a, as a method of speech, and we still hold on to it in our church today. There's, you know, so many um, various uh, elements of the, of, the, of the Aramaic or Syriac language which still exist within our community, and those those little elements, those little symbolic elements remind us of our roots as a church that stems right from the original 12 apostles. You know, um, we're a church that's connected intimately right to the gospel. We know exactly how to trace the, the traditions and the roots of our church right back to the time of Jesus himself. And that is something that should remind us when we are often presented with, with very colonialist discourse around us. You know, a lot of folks, um, you know, we, we've had these uh, discussions, of course, especially some of us who are more politically or, or socially um, activist type folks, um, have certainly had these conversations with our, um, with our uh, white compatriots, right? Uh, our co-religionists who often talk about um, the so-called civilizing force of, um, you know, Europeans bringing Christianity to India, this lovely, you know, spiritual journey that we've all embarked on, this, this, this path to the Messiah that we've all chosen to follow, as something that Europeans did a favor to us about. And yet, let me tell you something that could not be more wrong. And the church has done quite a lot to emphasize to us that this is not the true roots of Christianity, you know? So if we, if we, if we want to engage critically with Christian history, and critically with the narratives that European descendant Christian churches want to impose on our community in terms of Christianity being equivalent with European culture, you know, we have to look to our own, our, our own history to uncover the fact that that is simply not true. Christianity in our community, it, within a couple of decades, we will be celebrating the 2000th anniversary of Christianity in India. It is an unprecedented anniversary. Like, Within 20 years of the death of the Messiah, it had already spread to our shores. And yet we had been, during the colonial period, nearly 400 years of various forms of colonial occupation in India, European troops, European governments and cultural uh, entities tried to convince the Indian people that their version of Christianity was the more authentic one. I'm not trying to say that their version of Christianity is not authentic, but the notion that our Christianity has been shunted to the side is a very prevalent theme throughout our history. You know, we have been told routinely that we have not discovered knowledge for ourselves. We have not engaged in global relations for ourselves. And just this notion that, you know, the, the early St. Thomas Church is not important negates many things about early Indian history. It negates the fact that we had international relations with peoples all around the world. You know, we, we had a disciple of, of Christ come all the way from the Holy Land to India at a considerable distance at a time where there was little to none of the modern technology that exists today. You know, like there are several elements to that story which present 
you know, a, a, a genuine agency, you know, a real um, intention to colonize societies that is never provided in European narratives. You know, we'll, I'm sure many of you have studied Canadian history and you'll often hear, you know, Canadian historical narratives beginning in 1534, you know, when, when Jacques Cartier landed on Canadian soil and planted the French flag. Well, indigenous people lived here for over 15,000 years beforehand. Where is the mention of that? Does their history not count? You know, um, these are the questions that we have to critically engage with. Because if we, for example, allow our history to simply be defined by the arrival of Europeans on our shores, if anything, we, we deny the roots of our Christian faith. It is, if I may go so far as to say, it is counterproductive. It is, it is fundamentally counter to our Christian origins to deny the indigenous roots of our faith. It's a pretty crazy thing to break down. But anyway, that's... You know, it's something that, um, that you know, we kind of need to, again, break down the notions of our, of our church history to sort of unpack and, um, and really internalize. So um, this whole notion of the church's name, it, it mainly infers two things. So the Martha Ma Church is what is known as an Eastern Reformed Church, meaning while its theology, its social ideals um, are influenced by Reformation era Christianity. You know, we, we are very close with the Lutheran church, the Anglican church, and all these other entities. Our traditions and our culture are rooted in the Middle East. They're rooted in Asia. And the continuum of early churches that spread from Africa all the way to China, you know, that's where the roots of our Christianity are from. They're not in this, you know, this, this paradigm of colonial expansion, of capitalist expansion, of imperialist expansion. These things long predate the age of racism. You know, Christianity landed on our shores before the transatlantic slave trade. You know, that's how old Christianity goes into our, into our DNA. If you, you know, if, if you want to go as far as that, there are, you know, the, as you guys remember from, from Christian, from the, from the church history um, that we, that we break down, there are, um, there were many Jewish refugees who fled from the temple when it was destroyed by the Roman army, who came and settled in our community and became part of our community. Um, there were, you know, um, under the, uh, under Thomas of Canna, you know, there were many, uh, Syriac refugees who, again, escaped and melded into our community. We, we have roots to that area so much longer than European culture. And so then we really have to wonder why is it that Europeans are allowed to control the narrative of Christianity? When, when we use the actual language of Jesus in our church, why are we told to instruct everyone from the point of view of Greek and Latin culture? You know, these are these are real elements that I think we, we really need to think critically about and break down here. So, you know, the Christian faith, what, what's very important to take away here is that the Christian faith did not land on our shores as the result of, of brute force and colonization. It came peacefully. It came in the way that Christ originally planned for the faith to be spread all around the world. It came not with the sword, not with the spear, not with the army. It came with a single man landing on the shores of Kerala and preaching to people, simply the good news. That's it. In all of the stories that Thomas ever landed in India, he did not kill anybody. He did not provoke a war. He spoke the truth and people accepted it. And of course, eventually he paid for it with his life, as did all of the apostles. But you know, he, he spread the gospel. He managed to spread it all throughout Mesopotamia, the Persian Gulf countries, through South India, you know, he, he managed to do it all without raising a single finger because that is the power of the gospel. You know, that is the authentic message of the gospel. Jesus was able to convince multitudes simply by looking at them and speaking at them with humanity, with a, with a divine humanity that spoke to them, that understood their spiritual conflicts, their physical ailments, and he healed them. He didn't just leave them in a hole to deal with their own problems by themselves. He fixed them. He gave them the tools to fix their problems. And then he told his disciples to go around the world and provide these, these skills, this knowledge, this divine, this divine knowledge to every single community in the world and help them to solve their problems, to help them to grow closer to the creator. So this existed, you know, as, as we know, within its, its framework for a very long time, you know. Um, the, the church sent a delegate to the Council of Nicaea for in 325 AD, you know, the very foundation of Christianity. The St. Thomas community was there. All the way for 1,500 years, up until the arrival of the Portuguese in the 1500s. Now, when the Portuguese arrived, they brought something known as the 
the, the Portuguese Inquisition, the Catholic Inquisition, which was set up by the Pope of Rome in order to enforce Catholic orthodoxy all throughout the, the Christian world, to enforce this notion of you know, European culture of Latin language on all Christian communities of the world. And we were not any separate. When they landed in uh, Goa in the 1500s, they demanded that we stop using the Aramaic language, we stop using Asian traditions, and we embrace European languages and Latin culture in the church. And in 1599, um, they, 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 um, they enforced upon us uh, at the Synod of Diemper, uh, um, the notion that the Kerala Christian community had to be placed under Latin rule. So anyone who was caught speaking the Aramaic language in public could be imprisoned, tortured, even killed, you know? Uh, all of these stories that you see, I'm sure, in various TV shows of people being burned at the stake in, you know, um, in, in Spain, pay, paying horrific, horrific prices for their faith, happened in India too. You know, the St. Thomas Christian community, far from Christianity being a, a, a tool and a functionary of colonization, the earliest Christian community in Asia was right there at the forefront, facing the burden of colonization right on its, on its chest, you know? And the Christian community suffered under Portuguese rule for 50 years. La direct Latin control of our church was suffered for 50 years, but in 1653, a little over 100 years, after um, European control of India, um, uh, you know, had begun to take shape about, a, uh, um, sorry, um, about 150 years, I should say, and a little over 200 years before India's first coordinated independence struggle, um, members of the Syrian community finally decided they had had enough. And one of the first instances of open rebellion, of open rejection of European culture, believe it or not, came from our community literally like around the corner, <laughs> right here within Kerala. Kerala is the first site of anti-colonial resistance in Asia. Crazy to imagine, but it's true. Um, so that year, 3rd January of that year, um, the Malabar Christian community um, brought together their self-appointed archdeacon, um, meaning the community had selected him as, a, as an archdeacon that was not selected by Rome, Archdeacon Thomas, and swore a public oath on a granite cross standing right in front of a major church, vowing to reject the control of white Christian rulers and white Christian churches, and to reassert the traditional Eastern roots of the faith, and to, to reclaim their language, to reclaim their traditions against the imposition of European rules. And the, the oath that they swore is right there on your screen in front of you. By the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we swear that henceforth we will not obey the Franks, meaning European people, nor will we accept the faith of the Pope of Rome. They knew that they could be burned alive for this. They could not just be tortured. They could, they could be killed in the most horrific way. Their bodies destroyed in a way that would prevent any Christian burial. And yet their faith in Christ, their faith in the original faith that had been handed down to them from the time of Jesus itself was such that they openly, publicly declared their faith. And their faith was so strong that as the story goes, so many people came out to swear this oath that they had to tie ropes to it. This, uh, this granite cross that had been erected in, in the square had, had many ropes tied to it, and the people had gradually begun to yank on these ropes and, and drag them and drag them, and the faith was so strong that it bent a granite cross. And the cross still exists today. It still exists uh, at the particular church. I can't remember exactly which church it is, but um, there is still a bent cross that allegedly was bent by our very forefathers resisting Portuguese rule. And from that point onwards, um, we saw the restoration of the community's independence um, and, you know, the independence of the community that we still enjoy today, where our ancient traditions are still uh, maintained and kept intact. Now, if we point to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, it's a very, very famous line. But Jesus says, it was the, the, sorry, the, I'll just uh, provide a little bit of a uh, context to it there. So the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked him, why couldn't we drive the demon out? And Jesus answered, it was because you do not have enough faith. I assure you that if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, go from here to there and it will move. You can do anything with faith. Jesus quite literally says that with faith, mountains can be moved. And hey, maybe a mountain wasn't moved in this particular instance, 
But the faith, the, the, the driving faith in the gospel of Jesus that had been handed down to our forefathers by St. Thomas the Apostle himself was such that it moved a, a, a cross made out of stone that had existed for 1,500 years beforehand. That's what faith can do. And there is a living testament of it right here, right now. You know, it's, it's pretty remarkable. We have 400 years of, of direct history in the Markham Church of combating colonization. And in fact, the very moment, the inception of our church, the, the modern church as we know it today, was a reassertion of our independence, was a, was a fight against colonization. So understanding that while moving forward is, is something that I think it, it's a very powerful message to remind us um, what we need to do in the modern day. And it's not just here today. I'm not saying we only need to take this inspiration today. I'm saying our forefathers years and years and years ago were doing this too. Took that, the example that had been put forward at the Bent Cross Oath and, and took it forward in their governance of the church from that point onwards. So from the 1830s, uh, you see a whole uh, arrival of British and American missionaries under British colonial rule to Kerala. At that point, of course, we were still um, technically under our own ruler. Um, the Maharaja of Travancore was still technically the ruler, but he was under the protection of the British. And the British got to dictate a lot of laws that existed within Kerala at that time. But when, while this all was happening, a particular um, cleric of the, at that time, the Orthodox Church, um, came forward and began to realize a lot of the elements in um, the Anglican, Lutheran, and Methodist Church could be adapted to address the social ills that the Malayali Christian community faced at that point in time. And his name was Palakunnathu Abraham Malpan. Now, Abraham Malpan was a, a great leader. He was, a, he was a, an upstart in a time where incredible political repression exists. You know, when anyone spoke out against um, church authorities, political authorities, this was a time where people would be disappeared. They would be tossed into jail and they would never be heard from again. And yet Abraham Malpan was one of those people who, who took a firm stand for justice. He took a firm stand against corruptions that he saw emerging into the church and, and uh, wanted to bring them, um, bring them out and wanted to bring the Christian message more in a more accessible format to the common people of Kerala. So as such, he, he took a lot of the many ideas. He, he, he had an open discourse with, with many Western missionaries, and yet he never accepted. He refused. The, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Methodists tried many times to assert their control of what we know today as the Markham Church, and Abraham Malpan refused every single time. Each and every single one of his, of, of his successors did as well. In fact, it went so far that the Markham bishops went all the way to London to demand that the British crown stop trying to get their hands all over the, the governance of the early Martha Church. This was a time, again, you could easily be thrown in jail for doing something like this. And yet these men went, cassocks and, and beards and staves, and they went out to England, you know, into a country that didn't even recognize their humanity as people of color and asserted their rights on their soil. And that was in the 1830s. You know, that is like what, what, a, what a remarkable inspiration for us today as we grapple with the problems of, of state violence, the problems of police brutality, of the problems of, of certain public leaders, who I will not name, who take the Christian message and they warp it to suit their own personal needs. They warp it to suit uh, agendas of violence. They warp it to suit agendas of marginalization and hatred of the poor. These things that run counter to the very essence of what the gospel are, uh, of what the gospel is, excuse me. Um, one of the other great uh, reforms that Abraham Malpan was able to accomplish as well was the translation of the Holy Qurbana and um, the Bible into Malayalam. It was one of the very first times in, in history that it had ever been done. Parts had been translated in the past, but the entire uh, Bible was translated at that point in time. And, at, and all of a sudden, the, the liturgy and the Bible was publicly available to all people. Most common people in India didn't speak Syriac, but all of a sudden, they had a Bible in their own language that they could interact with and engage with. And thus, we have a wide social movement gradually beginning to emerge that would become the Martha Church that believed in applying the gospel as not only a, a spiritual vehicle, but a social vehicle, a vehicle for the social changes that were beginning to engulf India at that time. 
So, you know, again, this is the roots of where, you know, we as the Martha Church are always uh, seen amongst Indian Christian churches as the quote unquote, the missionary church, you know, uh, incredible amount of missionary work is done by a community of only 1.2 million people worldwide. And yet we have something along, oh, I can't remember the exact, um, the exact numbers, but it's something along the lines of 20% of missionary activity in India is coordinated by the Martha Church. Crazy, a million people. And yet they're able to accomplish that kind of, of power that kind of, of truth to power that's being actively implemented on the ground in the name of the gospel. And that all started with this simple act of resistance that existed at that time. You know, the Martha Church has gone forward to bring Christian ecumenism all throughout, all throughout India and to bring interfaith relationships into its, its political, its social and spiritual messaging. And so we see here, again, the, the seeds of, of social reformation of nationalism and Gandhiism. Um, gradually beginning to take root in the Martha Church. But what does that mean in terms of the Indian context? We've understood the Kerala context, but what about India as a whole? Well, India was still suffering under British rule at that time. And contrary to the way many people would like to portray Christianity as, as, a, you know, as a vehicle for colonization, and, and as many um, you know, Western you know, very regressive and, and often sometimes racist ideologues and preachers will sometimes use, they will say Christianity was a Europeanizing, a Westernizing tool that was presented. Well, here we have evidence that the Martha Church not only took a role, but an active role in combating Westernization, in combating the destruction of indigenous culture in India and utilizing our traditional culture and the Christian faith in tandem to fight uh, colonial imperial domination of our society. So um, right off the bat, um, you know, the uh, Mahatma Gandhi um, in, in instilled um, and, and inspired many people with the Swadeshi movement to, um, to use khadi as robes. Um, so if you guys don't know what khadi is, it's a specific type of hand spun um, cloth that is made from cotton, flax, jute, and various other types of indigenous materials that were all inspired because at that time, um, cloth was heavily taxed by the British government. And Gandhi um, and various other uh, Swadeshi economic leaders, such as um, uh, Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar and various other uh, great leaders of the early independence movement, pointed out that boycotting British products was the best way to undermine the, the, uh, the colonial uh, the, the economic roots of the, of the British colonial power. And the Martha Church jumped in behind this entirely. In fact, it was a, for a very long time, a, a concerted practice for about 30 years before independence that Martha priests wore khadi robes. They wore all of their cassocks, all of the, um, the, uh, uh, the liturgical robes um, that they would wear were all stitched from homespun clothing. In fact, many early clergy people volunteered with the Congress at that time to learn the art of hand, hand uh, weaving and hand stitching their own clothes in order to help their communities to divest themselves from the economics of British colonialism. Pretty crazy thing to do for a church, something that is, but again, it, it goes back down to the very principle of servant leadership that's expounded in the gospel. Can't you imagine it yourself, Jesus sitting in front of a spinning wheel and spinning his own cloth? sewing his own clothes, doing his own work for the community. That's exactly what Jesus did. And, and it's remarkable that, you know, long before the, the dawn of modern social justice movements, we had leaders in our own church, you know, providing a, a, a remarkable example for our people to practically apply the lessons that the gospel provides in our day-to-day -day services in our day-to-day, -day, in our day-to-day -day lives to combat the social ills that we saw around us. You know, the Maraman Convention was a great example. Many, many nationalist speakers used to come and speak at the Maraman Convention. And this is where we have all the people of various, um, various political affiliations, various religions, various Christian denominations would come. And that, that tradition still exists till today. To this day, the Maraman Convention is the largest Christian gathering in Asia, you know? Um, and uh, there is, you know, a, th this legacy continued for a long time, even after independence. Yohanan Martama Tirmeni, who was the um, uh, pro, he was a, he was the uh, the Martama Metropolitan throughout the 1970s. When India's democracy began to fail in the 1970s, he was threatened with arrest, and his response to the threats with arrest, he went to Delhi and hand delivered a letter, 
stating and demanding that the government back off and allow democratic elections. This is the model of servant leadership that has been you know, provided by early Muslim church leaders. Now, this is something that we can, again, apply in our day-to-day -day lives, something that we should be trying to bring forward into how we, we interact with, um, with, our, uh, with our faith and with our, um, and with our particular social circumstances that surround us. Now, again, if we look at the, um, the, ind the independence movement, uh, we also, you know, we have seen quite a lot, you know, with people like Abraham Martoma Tirmeni and various other uh, great um, leaders of the church, we've understood what the clergy have been able to do. But I think this is something, I think all of us here have noticed this before, you know, we often feel as though when social change is supposed to happen in the Martoma church, we're supposed to just let the Achins and the Tirmenis do that work for us. You know, it's their job to preach. It's their job to enact the gospel. It's not our work, right? And yet we have 150 years of evidence in our own church's history of lay people in the Martha Church taking up the struggle for independence, the anti-colonial struggle, agitating against poverty, agitating against casteism, colorism. You name the social ill and I guarantee you, you look hard enough and you will find a Martha Mite who is right there at the forefront of it. A great, a great example here is Titus G. So Titus Tevertundil was a, um, a very prominent uh, activist and he was a, a writer and journalist from Maraman. You know, not very far. If anyone's from um, like the Rani area, Ayrur, like Maraman is around the corner, you know, and Titus G was one of the 78 activists who was personally chosen by the Congress leadership to lead the Salt Satyagraha in 1930 and they were all arrested and they they were the ones who conducted the strike from prison you know they in in the name of uh, various villagers workers rights under caste um, and and outcast peoples we had not only a malayali but a member of the martama church who was right there right at the seat of the action and provided a very important minority religious voice um a voice for many uh, for many um uh, South Indians who had been often left out of the arenas of political participation. We had an example of a Martha Mite who was right there at the forefront leading that charge. It's pretty, pretty crazy, but, you know, we, we again, we don't think about, you know, we, we, we have often wanted to portray ourselves as Martha Mites as people who are somewhat removed from social justice causes, you know, people who are somewhat removed from our nation's history. You know, we're proud to be Indians in a very, you know, generic sense, but when we understand how deep the Martama community really went in terms of, of agitating for the independence that allowed our, you know, our modern day prosperity and allowed us to, to throw off the shackles of colonial rule, it really runs deep. It really runs incredibly intimately to the roots of our community. Um, second up here, George Joseph is a very, very great example as well. Uh, he was from Changanur. And um, he was a Martama lawyer who operated out of uh, Madure um, in Tamil Nadu. Um, and he was um, one of the primary Christian leaders of the Vaikim Satyagraha, and, uh, which, which, uh, and he was specifically a, an activist who fought against casteism. He, um, he demanded from the mid 1910s onwards that the various temples um, in India would open their doors towards low caste peoples. And he, you know, again, worked very closely with, with Gandhi, with Ambedkar, with a lot of very, um, uh, very high ranking early independence leaders and was a very important Malayali voice at that time. Um, and again, when we think about the problems of caste that, that you know, still exist today, you know, we talk, we talk about caste as a very modern movement, you know, like, oh, it's, it's, it's only in the post-colonial world we've, we've ever tried to, you know, address the problems of caste. You know, we've, we've framed British rule, if anything, as something that alleviated the problems of caste. And, you know, like our independence and, and handing independence back to Indian people allowed us to, you know, partake in, in caste once again. And yet, once again, we see the example, you know, not only Indians in general, but Marthamites leading the fight against caste-based discrimination years and years before the modern day. You know, again, we have been we have been sold such a such a skewed view of what colonial rule represented, where um, you know progress was associated with the West for many many years. You know, we uh, anyone you ask about colonization will always say, "Oh, you know, the British when they came, they provided us a railroad." You know, oh, at least we speak the English language. 
at least we have British education. And yet, India still suffers from a great deal of poverty. You know, for all these supposed benefits that colonization provided, India's economy didn't actually grow very much until India was independent again. <laughs> you know, you look, you look back down at the roots of Indian society, and it has always been Indians at the forefront making that change for themselves, right? Um, you know, bring the example of India on economics alone. I mean, in 1700, India was 27% of the global, uh, shared 27% shared of global GDP. By the time the British left in 1947, it was 2%. You know, there is a, there's a stark difference between the, the version of colonialism that we've been presented and, and the, you know, the, this notion that we have to legitimately embrace co colonialism and embrace its legacies because apparently Christianity was brought to us by co colonialism. You know, democracy was brought to us by colonialism. Democracy existed in India from 500 BC. You know, Europeans did not bring democracy to India. If anything, we fought against Europeans to reestablish democracy. We have, you know, uh, they, they talk about, you know, this whole notion that, you know, Christianity, which, which inspired so many great social movements and social changes, it's from Europe. Well, that's not true. It existed in India for 2000 years. Again, I, it may seem somewhat repetitive, but it's, it's something that has been repeatedly drilled into our heads. This notion that colonization provided us not only as Indians, but as the St. Thomas Christian community with the positionality that we have today. And that's simply not true. That's simply not true. We have had uh, a great deal of, of opportunities to agitate and, um, and to, you know, we, we, we've had to really agitate every step of the way to be able to have our, our, um, our current privileges, our current, um, you know, advanced status that exists. But speaking of advanced status, I think um, something that we as the church um, once took very, very seriously, um, and something that is, is not quite as prominent anymore in the post-independence world, where again, um, caste has become, you know, less and less of a discussion, because people, you know, assumed that, oh, well, simply because the constitution prohibits caste-based discrimination, it's somehow not an issue anymore. Well, it is. Uh, casteism is a serious problem in India. I'm sure we've all um, encountered it if, if, we, uh, if we have any folks here who uh, grew up in India um, or, you know, the, 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 the different, um, the anti-ethnic rivalries, the, the persecution for being Christians, these things, again, they go back a very long way. And the Martha Church at one point was, was deeply dedicated to the fight against casteism. As I mentioned before, from the Reformation era all the way through to the Vaikim Satyagraha and all the way up until the 1936 Temple Entry Proclamation, which allowed uh, people of all castes, to all Hindus of all castes, to enter, enter any Hindu temple in Kerala. Um, the Marthama Church was right there at the forefront. In fact, in 1936, um, the Marthama Church directly took um, leadership positions right alongside Dalit leaders um, in agitating um, against the, um, the, uh, the early leaders of um, the, the Maharaja and the Divan of Travancore and various other people who wanted to maintain the caste-based divisions in society and openly threatened rebellion against them. Speaking of which, I realize I just forgot someone very, very important. <laughs> so I'm gonna just pop right back here. My notes are a little bit um, tossed out of order. But the third person here who I didn't mention is very, very important, especially for the ladies among us, Achama Cheryan, who was a, a great, again, a very important female leader of the, um, of the political movements out of the Martama Church. She was uh, the only prominent female leader on the um, coordinating committee of the Travancore State Congress, which of course led the independence movement. And uh, she was a major agitator for um, the integration of Travancore into India in 1947. Um, and she was the chief organizer of the very, very famous 1939 Trivandrum Palace rally to, pr to protest the anti-democratic crackdowns that the royal government had been um, imposing upon the people of, uh, of, of Kerala. Um, when the British army, in fact, tried to um, scare away the demonstrators by, you know, bringing out a megaphone and, and calling out to them that they would start open, opening fire randomly, um, uh, Acha Materian picked up a megaphone of her own and called out to the British and said, if you want to start firing, you can start with me. You know, this is the kind of, again, the selfless service that, that was, was labeled right there in, in the Bible. When the disciples put themselves 
out in front of people who were being persecuted and willingly offered their own lives to, um, to resist these unfair powers, these powers of persecution and hatred that they were being put up against. And to remarkable effect, because of Achimacharyan's work at that time, of her, of her very, very brave motion of just standing in front of you know, this, entire, uh, this entire rally full of unarmed civilians, the British were, were cowed and they eventually didn't end up opening fire. You know, just that power of standing firm and holding space as Christian people, as working for the gospel, as working as Indians for our own community, had incredible power. We didn't even need to pick up a rifle. Many people did. But, you know, the Marthama Church showed that Christian methods of protest worked. In the end, we got our independence. In the end, we, we got these things, you know. So it's a, it's a pretty remarkable story. Again, the, the history of activism that exists within the church. Um, and it, it really, really goes deeply to the roots of our community. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of early, um, early theologians in the Martha Mart Church were, were heavily inspired by a lot of very prominent anti-caste um, Dalit activists at the time, such as Jyoti Rao Phule, um, Bhimra Ramji Ambedkar, as I mentioned before, and Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who, um, uh, you know, both, uh, who all three of whom struggled heavily against the caste system. Um, Raja Ram Mohan Roy was, in fact, the one who put forward the original movement to abolish sati or widow burning. Um, you know, it's often written in our, not only our history textbooks in, um, in colonial history textbooks throughout the world, but even in Indian history textbooks that the East India Company abolished this practice. This is not true. It was the, the result of 40 years of coordinated campaigning amongst grassroots activists. You know, again, the tradition of democracy runs so deep, but in order for colonial narratives to succeed, they need to convince Indian people that we did know, we knew nothing about democracy, we knew nothing about the Christian faith. And again, this is simply not true. There is not a shred of evidence of that anywhere in our history. You know, the democratic sensibilities of the church, the, the Christian sensibilities of our community have run very, very long. But this whole agitation for casteism, uh, for, for, I'm sorry, I should say against caste system, was not without controversy. There was a, a massive debate within the church about the, the identity of the Syrian Christian community, because as many of you may know, uh, but for those of you who, I'm, who were raised out of India, you may not know, we are considered a forward caste in India. So um, there are several categories of castes which exist. There are um, forward castes, so people who um, enjoy quite a degree of caste or class privilege. There are other backward castes, um, so people who are, are somewhat in a medium lens, but they're considered underprivileged. And then you have scheduled castes, who are peoples like um, Dalit communities, untouchables, Harijans. There's a couple of different terms that those communities prefer to use, predominantly Dalits. But again, we are quite a bit high towards the, high, the higher point of the caste hierarchy. I mean, you'll, you might hear it even in the church history that is still being promoted these days. Um, a lot of our ancestors, the early, early converts of the community were Brahmins and Kshatriya and other high ranking castes. Um, but why do, we, why do we put that on such a pedestal? Why has this casteist discourse still existed? And it's simply because this is something that exists in Indian culture. Of course, it's not endorsed at all by the Bible. I mean, Jesus interacting with the Samaritan woman and, and Samaritans in general proves that casteism is something fundamentally contrary to the gospel. And yet it's something that still exists within the church. I know that some of y'all might have wanted to walk in here and assume that I would just be very, very you know, positive about all of these legacies about the church. But this is something that, you know, it still does impact our community quite heavily. And to be fair, the Matama church hierarchy has tried quite a bit to um, eradicate these problems, but they still exist. They still exist in a very tangible way for a lot of people. I'm sure for some of us in this chat who are of dark skin, um, you've heard many different, uh, you know, various problems of don't go out in the sun. Don't, don't, you know, try very hard to avoid getting darker. Uh, you may have even been recommended fair and lovely skin cream at some point in your life. These things happen. You know, and these things are as a result of the casteism that our community has spent since the time of Abraham Malpan, meaning almost 200 years fighting against. And it's a social ill that we still struggle against. 
So, you know, as I said, you know, there's a, quite a lot of Dalit and working class outreach that exists today as a result of this years of grassroots pressure. Um, but there's a lot of work left to go for the Madhima Church. You know, there's a lot of effort that it remains to be seen yet within the Madhima community. And to that end, let's think of that in terms of what problems, you know, just as we go forward into this last, um, uh, this last slide, um, what sort of elements can we think of? What sort of things can we address within our Mahatma community as, you know, contrary to the principles of the gospel, as, you know, uh, problems that we see in our parishes that we can use examples from Mahatma church history, that we can use the gospels to combat, to, to address, and to, to rectify in a Christian way. But this last story is probably one of my favorites. Uh, it's one of the most interesting things, I think, in um, in pretty much the history of the church in general. Um, but in 1959, a very, very famous individual, uh, none other than the Reverend Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., came to Kerala. Um, this was even before the I Have a Dream, this was before all of this, um, all of these you know, incredibly intense moments in his life that he was so well known for, he actually set foot on Kerala soil first. Because he wanted to come to India, he had read um, Gandhi, Ambedkar, and other uh, prominent um, nonviolent resistance activists who had come from India and understood um, and wanted to understand a little bit better the influence of Christian theology and the influence of Indian culture in their way of approaching resistance practices. So, um, you know, I think, you know, again, kind of touching upon the, the casteist issue that we were just um, kind of grappling with a little while ago. Um, we talk a lot about how Martin Luther King is very influenced by Mohandas Gandhi. But why do we not talk about how Bhimra Ambedkar also influenced a lot of, of, his, of, his, of his thought? This story that we're about to talk about, I, I bet you that most of you have not heard of it before. And we have to question ourselves why once again, why again, not anything against Gandhiji. He provided many high ranking um, and very important um, lessons for many activists throughout the world to engage in nonviolent resistance. But Gandhiji was a high caste Hindu, whereas um, Ambedkar Sahib was a low caste Buddhist. You know, we have to grapple again with the problems of religious positionality, caste positionality, to understand why the contributions of uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar has not been have not been seen particularly prominently in global nonviolent resistance discourse, you know? Um, and especially because Ambedkar was often seen, again, much like Jesus many, many years before as a radical who was not afraid to openly say what he saw were the corruptions in society. Um, and, um, and yeah, without further ado, let's get into this final anecdote that's provided here. So um, in 1959, when Martin Luther King visited India, he ended up in Trivandrum and he visited a school. Now, precisely where the school is, is not exactly sure. Um, it has long since um, been merged into other schools and the, the building doesn't even exist anymore. But um, there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest that it was a member of a missionary church that, um, that existed at the time that was engaging in Dalit missionary. And one of the few church missionary work and one of the few churches who did that was the Martima church. So of course, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, there's no historical evidence to confirm it, but the likelihood of this having been, this meeting being in a Martima church brings us a very, very close connection to a remarkable pillar of Christian resistance in the world. Um, so when Martin Luther King um, walked in, he, you know, he, he, he addressed this, uh, he, was, he was there to address the school children um, and to kind of understand where they, come, they came from. And all of the children in the school were the children of uh, people who were legally untouchables, people who were legally of the scheduled caste or scheduled tribes in India. And um, when he, he came, he sat in, he, he witnessed how their school functioned. and when the principal came to introduce him, something crazy happened. The principal said the following words. Young people, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. And when he initially heard those words, Martin Luther King was kind of offended. You know, the un untouchable status. Oh, well, he didn't know all that much about the intricacies of Indian culture, but he knew untouchables were not people to be 
aspired to, or at least so he thought. People of the Dalit communities, these, um, these communities who were, who were marked by the stigma of untouchability, this, this was the ultimate, you know, the, the rejection by the wider Indian society. And yet while he sat there and listened to the speakers who were talking before him, you know, he was, um, he was recounting the story in, um, in a church in, in Alabama about six years after uh, this story was, uh, was taking place. And he realized, he, he said in that moment that, um, you know, I, I realized at that time that uh, the struggle of black folk in the United States, the struggle of the Negro in the United States, for, to use his own terms, was within the realm of untouchability. I had never understood that the poverty, the social segregation, the separate facilities predicated on the supposed inferiority and impurity of the Negro, and the over-policed neighborhoods that were ridden by crime, poverty, and hopelessness of youths, all closely parallel the circumstances of untouchable people in India. The Dalit communities in the United, in, in the United States were black people, were indigenous peoples, and eventually when they arrived, less so in the United States, probably more so in Canada and in Britain, but Asians as well would eventually come to join that number. So when we cast ourselves, you know, we as Syrian Christians have often taken pride in our high caste status, especially older traditional folks within the community will often talk about, you know, well, they're very proud to be, um, to be Syrians. You know, you'll see um, matrimonial ads, which will, you know, feature little caste monikers in, in the matrimonial ad. And yet within our own territory, we, we love to enjoy this, this model minority status. I'm sure you all have heard of this term, the model minority before, and yet, when we come to Canada, to the United States, to Britain, we, are, we have been historically, and in many cases, especially in the post 9-11 world, we still are being treated like an untouchable class, being treated as a community of people to be segregated from the white majority. And so when we understand our position within European descendant societies, white societies, from the lens of the lesson that Martin Luther King came to Kerala to learn, we have to think about our own positionality as well. Why are we as a church with such a long history, a very long established history of activism, of fighting for social change, of implementing the gospel in a practical way? Why have we bought into the model minority? Why have we bought into casteism? And why do we buy into colorism, sexism, any of these terrible things, these social ills that plague our community. A little bit of food for thought, right? But anyway, Jesus provides a very clear example of nonviolent resistance. And, and, you know, Martin Luther King attributes the works of Gandhi, of Ambedkar, and of Jesus in Luke chapter 6 and in um, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew uh, chapter 6 through 9 um, as fundamental to the construction of the United States Civil Rights Movement. So this, this connection between you know, leaders of the Marthama Church and someone as eminent as Martin Luther King. That's an incredible legacy. That's huge shoes to fill. And moving into these final steps of discussion, it's stuff for us to kind of mull over and to think about um, as how do we fill those shoes, right? But I've talked for quite a bit. I've talked for nearly an hour now, my goodness. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd like to bring this to a, a concept of discussion here, if everyone would be willing to, co to uh, contribute. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if you, have a, you, if you don't necessarily want to speak and you'd just like to text something, you can text it to Ruben and he'll be able to, uh, you know, one of our facilitators here, our lovely facilitators, either um, Ash or Ruben, will be able to read it for uh, the group and we can initiate a conversation like that. So first off, uh, our history has tended to pull us closer to established European churches in Canada and elsewhere to the detriment of other global connections. Um, in doing so, we have neglected fellowships with Black and non-Indian Asian Christian communities. So how might we go about reaching out to and working with these communities on ecumenical and social justice initiatives? And what implications does that have for our community? Quite a lot to unpack in that, in that question there, but in a nutshell, how do we better reach, reach out to Black and Asian Christian communities? And divesting ourselves a little bit from exclusively working with white people and more towards other colonized peoples, what 
what effects might that have on the way we practice Christianity, on the way we preach the gospel? 